Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mindy Mandel, and I am here again with Jacob and Jed, and we are going on with the Republic. So as always, we are using the uh, Loeb Classical Library, the Paul Shorey translation, and there is a PDF in the description box. So last time, uh, we're working, we got into justice. So we looked at uh, wisdom, we looked at courage, we looked at temperance or soberness, I think is what it's translated as here, Sofferson. And then we finally got into justice last week. And we ended last week with a demonstration that there are three functions in the soul. Let me just jump over to the text here. And so um, this is section 14, I believe, in, this, um, in book four here. And we saw this idea... Socrates, to demonstrate it, used the idea of being thirsty but refusing to drink. And so you have the desire to drink, but then you also have the rational part of the soul that says, for whatever reason, you're not going to drink. And so he names this rational part. And this is on page 397, um, for those of you using the same text. And this is at uh, 439C, the Stephanus number, 439C. So there's the rational part of the soul that says we shouldn't drink today. And then there's what he's calling the appetitive part. So it has the same root as appetite. So it has to deal with the desires, the desiring part of the soul. But then he says that there's also a third part, what in Greek is called the thumos, or here he calls it the high-spirited part or we talked about it last week as willpower, the part that chooses to work together with the rational part to say, this is what we're going to do, as opposed to listening to the appetitive part. So these were the three parts of the soul. And then as a further example, he gave that story of seeing dead bodies near the place where um, public executions are done. And you don't want to look, but there's a part of you that really wants to look. And so... Um, this was a story of someone who finally gave in and looked. Okay, so that's where we ended it off. Okay, and so we're going to pick it up from there and continue on with looking at these three parts and getting a better understanding of what the thumos is. Um, so just as a reminder here, now we are on page 401. This is section 15, 440b, for those of you with a different translation. And so this is where picking it up. So just to look at the very end of the last section, because it carries on. Um, sorry, before I jump into this, did either of you have any questions or comments about what we did last time? Ready to go on? Okay. Yeah. Um, so Glaucon says that he had heard that story of the man who um, saw the dead bodies. And Socrates says, yet surely this anecdote signifies that the principle of anger, this thumos, this... Um, high-spirited part. I don't know if anger, a anger doesn't really fit it, but that's um, a common translation here. And I think that's maybe what's in the Greek because it's a common translation. But our idea of anger is different. And so I think it can be a little confusing, but this high-spirited part, this anger in the sense of getting defensive or fighting for what is right, a kind of a righteous anger, if you will. Um, it. it in an unhealthy way, it can be the other kind of anger, but the ideal here, this principle is a principle, it's the healthier kind. But it signifies that this principle of thumos sometimes fights against desires as an alien thing against an alien. And Glaucon says, yes, it does. Okay, and then we continue from here. So same rules, okay? Yeah. Okay, okay great. So whenever you're ready. All right, so as Socrates, mm, yes, Socrates. And, mm. right. and do we not on many other occasions observe when his desires constrain a man contrary to his reason that he reviles himself and is angry with that within which masters him and that as it were in a faction of two parties the high spirit of such a man becomes the ally of his reason but it's making common cause with the desires against the reason when reason whispers low thou must not 
that I think is a kind of thing you would not affirm ever to have perceived in yourself, nor, I fancy, in anybody else either. No, by heaven. Again, when a man thinks himself to be in the wrong, is it not true that the nobler he is, the less he, he, is he capable of anger, though suffering hunger and cold, and whatsoever else at the hands of him who he believes to be acting justly therein? And, as I say, his spirit refuses to be aroused against such a one. True. But what, when a man believes himself to be wronged, does not his spirit in that case seethe and grow fierce, and also because of his suffering, hunger, cold, and the like, and make itself the ally of what he judges just? And in noble souls it endures and wins the victory and will not let go until either it achieves its purpose, or death ends all, or, as a dog is called back by a shepherd, it is called back by the reason within and calmed. Your similitude is perfect and conforms and confirms our former statements that the helpers are, as it were, dogs subject to the rulers, who are, as it were, shepherds of the city. You apprehend my meaning excellently. But do you also take note of this? Of what? That what we now think about the spirited element is just the opposite of our re recent surmise. For then we supposed it to be a part of the appetitive. But now, far from that, we say that in the factions of the soul, it much rather marshals itself on the side of the reason. By all means. Is it then distinct from this too, or is it a form of the rational, so that there are not three, but two kinds in the soul, the rational and the appetitive, or just as in the city there were three existing kinds that composed its structure, the money makers, the helpers, the consulars, so also in the soul there exists a third kind, this principle of high spirit, which is the helper of reason by nature, unless it is corrupted by evil nature. We have to assume nurture. <laughs> we have to assume it is a third. Yes provided it shall have been shown to be something different from the rational, as it has been shown to be other than the appetitive. That is not hard to be shown, for that much one can see in children, that they are, from their very birth, chock full of rage and high spirit, angry babies. But, as for reason, some of them, to my thinking, never participate in it. And the majority, quite late. Yes, by heaven, excellently said. And further, one could see in animals that what you say is true. And to these instances, we may add the testimony of Homer quoted above. He smote his breast and chided thus his heart. For there, Homer has clearly represented that in us which has reflected about the better and the worse as rebuking that which feels unreasoning anger as if it were a distinct and different thing. 
You are entirely right. Okay, yeah, and this quote was used in the section about the right words to use. And um, so somebody's heartbroken, but he, you know, strikes his chest and says, stop it, you know, stop hurting. So that's that reference. Um, I want to go back to the beginning of this section here because there are a bunch of examples used. And I want to make sure that we understand them. Um, the way it's written here, I don't know if it's Plato or the translator, but it's just not really that clear. Um, so I want to go through these examples and make sure we're seeing what he's saying. Um, so going back to the beginning here, the first example is that when somebody's desires constrain him contrary to his reason, he reviles himself and is angry with that which in with masters him. What's the situation? He is uh, upset with the rational part of himself. Maybe he feels uh, like slighted. Which is the part that masters him in this example? Thought it might be the rational part of the soul. All right. So, yeah, his desires constrain him contrary to his reason. Oh, <laughs> maybe the appetitive part mm. then. <laughs> hmm. So he's he's angry with himself for having desires, right? Yes. Yeah. Um. And and that, as it were, in a faction of two parties, the high spirit of such a man becomes the ally of his reason. Okay, do you see how the, the high-spirited part then is working with the reason? Right. And so he's angry with himself for having desires that constrain him from following his reason. Hmm. But the high-spirited part is working with the reason. Um, but it's making common cause with the desires against the reason when reason whispers, lo, thou must not. But then he says, but that doesn't really happen, does it? Mm -hmm. um, maybe it does for some people, but um, apparently not these people. Um, when a man thinks himself to be in the wrong, is it not true that the nobler he is, the less he is capable of anger through suffering, hunger, and cold? So if you're suffering, but you think it's your own fault, that you did something wrong in this while you're suffering now, you're going to bear it well, is I think the idea here. Um, also, he says um, that you'll suffer and also whatsoever else at the hands of him who he believes to be acting justly therein. So what you might call just punishment, when we were talking in the Gorgias of the difference between just and unjust punishment. So that idea here that if you think it's just, you you have a different reaction to it, right? You won't be aroused to get, like if, um, if you think that the punishment is just, you're not going to be angry or hateful towards the person who's punishing you. If you break the law and you go to jail, you accept it and you don't, you're not angry at the system for putting you in jail. But he says, when a man believes himself to be wronged, does not his spirit in that case seethe and grow fierce, and also because of his suffering, hunger, cold, and the like, and make itself the ally of what he judges to be just? Okay, so different situation. If you think the punishment or the, or the treatment is unfair, unjust, you're going to have a different reaction to it. So there's that part of you that reacts, and it makes itself the ally of what he judges just. And in noble souls, it endures and wins the victory and will not let go until either it achieves its purpose or death ends all, or as a dog is called back by a shepherd, it's called back by the reason within and calmed. What does that mean? So you're 
upset because you mm-hmm. don't think your situation is appropriate for mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. So you try to make it right, or mm-hmm. you die trying to make it right, mm-hmm. or your rational part uh, brings you back to mm-hmm. calm. Good. Right. If you feel like nothing is going to change, <clears throat> and there's no point fighting this. <clears throat> yeah. And then we have the example here of, um, this was a reference, and Jacob mentioned at the end of the last meeting, that this kind of sounds like the idea of the high-spirited dog. And so there's a reference to that right here. And um, the footnote says the it's the funnest number, um, but I, I forget off him. But anyway, um, oh yeah, D is um, 376B, if you want to look back on your own later. But 376B is where that idea came in, of the high-spirited part is kind of like a, a, a guard dog that's very gentle to its master, but very fierce against those who are attacking. And so now we can see how that would fit here as well. That it's very gentle to the reasoning part of the soul, but fierce to anyone who is unjust to you, or any injustice within the soul also. Um, Oh yeah, I made a note here. It's page 173 in this book, for those who want to go back to look at the dog. Um... Oh, yes. And then here he sets up the three parts of the soul um, as lining up with the three parts of the city. The highlighter worked this time. Okay, so so this was at the bottom of page 403 going on to page 405. Um, Is it then distinct from this too? Or is this a form of the rational? Oh yeah, by the way, um, just as a reminder that um, last week in the example of the thirsty person who denies themselves drink, there was the question of whether the thumos or the high-spirited part is part of the appetitive. Is it a desire? Is it another desire within the soul? And there are just two. Or is it a third part? And so he made the case that there are three. And so here he's saying, just as we looked at that, now we're going to have to question, is it not the same as the rational part? Or does it differ from that? Is it truly a third? So we've eliminated the idea that it's just another part of the appetitive. So now we have to eliminate the idea that it's another part of the rational. Um, The rational, the appetitive, and this. And then there are three parts in the city as well, the money makers, the helpers, and the counselors. How would we match these up if we were to follow our analogy and match each part of the the city with a part of the soul? What would the money makers be? Maybe that's a hard one, so we'll go on to the others. How about the helpers or the counselors? Do any of them jump out as this one is easy? We'll do the easy ones first. Trying to find this uh, distinction. Well, uh, mm-hmm. in our tripartite soul, mm-hmm. we had uh, already heard the example with there's like a high spirit. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> is it, isn't it just kind of exactly matching up with what we're talking about here with the. Uh, mm-hmm rational the thumos mm-hmm. and the uh, right yeah so those the three thing. match to the money makers the helpers and the counselors so which is which the the money makers be appetitive mm-hmm. and then the knowledge would be rational and uh high oh. spirit thumos mm. right so okay so the money makers would be the appetitive part um how about the counselors? Who would would they be the rational part or the high spirited part? It, 
It might help to yeah, read on the money makers more. was clear, but uh, mm -hmm. unclear okay. on the helpers and the concepts. So fortunately, there's a comma, not a period. He goes on to say, so also in the soul, there exists a third kind, this principle of high spirit, which is the helper of reason by nature, unless it is corrupted uh -huh. by evil nurture. So the helpers and counselors are mm -hmm. the one uh, category. So those would be the rational, I, I suspect. Mm -hmm. So what is he saying? Jed, maybe you can help out a little here. So counselor, what is he saying here about the high-spirited parts? Mm -hmm. The word counselor, is that an old English word? What does it mean? Um, those who give advice or counsel. So it's not a leader. Not the not the king. It's the one who counsels the king. Yes. Um, we tend to think of counselors as counseling those that are equals or below, but it's possible to be a counselor to the king as well. Sure. Counsels the soul in this case. It could be on top. Mm. Um. So we've got the counselor, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. helper. Mm -hmm. See, I think the confusing part is if the counselor is the helper to the king, then we've got a helper to the helper. But if the counselor was like an old English word that meant ruler, then that would make more sense that we've got a ruler and we've got a bunch of people around him supporting him, like mm -hmm. protecting him. Mm. Yeah, you can think of, I think that would be fine to think of him that way. Those who the wise, um, I guess if you want to, if, if you want to think of the soul as an aristocracy or as a, um, <clears throat> as a <clears throat> that kind of ruler, which he is later going to do, then you can think of that counselor as a ruler who gives good counsel to the soul. Because, like, the if you think of, um, of rulership as an art, it's for the benefit of the subjects. So the ideal ruler should give good counsel. So I think that we're kind of splitting cares by trying to separate them. So I think it's fine to put them together. Does that help in any, Jacob? It's right there. I'll give you a hint. It's right there <laughs> in the part after the comma. <laughs> In the soul, there exists a third kind. You've got the appetitive and the rational. We've already agreed on those. But there is this third kind, this principle of high spirit, which is the helper of reason. I see. So helpers. It's the helpers. Humor. Yes. <laughs> so the helper is the helper of counselors, okay, as it's stated here. And the, counsel and the helpers are the doggies, mm -hmm. right? Yes, that's right. right. And so there was that um, comparison of like the idea of like the dogs that are very protective of their masters, but get very defensive when anybody tries to attack them. So there's any injustice in the soul or any justice from without, the high-spirited part gets riled up. But... Um, very gentle to its master, to the counselors. So it works together with them as helpers to them. So the helpers would be the smoters. The desires um, would be the breast. And the he who smotes the breast would be the counselor. Uh. <laughs> or chi smoting one's breast and chiding mm. one's mm. heart. What, a, what an expression. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes. Also, we love standing, Homer. Yeah, well, he mm -hmm. does quote Homer a lot. That's interesting. Uh -huh. um, yes. Also interesting to this is how um, the ideas, the idea of justice, the role the idea of justice plays. I mean, we hear the expression that all war is a, really a battle of ideas. And here um, mm -hmm. we see that if someone has the idea that they're suffering injustice. Mm -hmm. They become mm -hmm. like this high spirited guard dog mm -hmm. and they will mm -hmm. fight tooth and they'll fight to the death 
And it's interesting because that would mean all you've got to do is convince a, a group of people that um, something beneficial for them is unjust, and they will fight against their own benefit. Like, convince a group of people that, I don't know, wearing a mask in an epidemic is <laughs> the most unjust thing, and they will fight against reason itself. Yes, absolutely. On, on the other side of that, we have convince a group of people that capitalism and wealth inequality and having a small group of people have everything, that's justice, and they will be complacent. They will be complacent. They will, they will not fight against such injustice. You just have to convince them that those at the bottom deserve to be there for whatever reason. Deserve this mm -hmm. suffering. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. That we all have equal opportunity. And so if you are at the bottom, it's just the way it worked out. And it's all just. There are all these different frameworks of justice mm -hmm. that can justify mm -hmm. inflicting suffering or against others. And here mm -hmm. we are seeing the dynamics of um being fervently attached to that, even in mm -hmm. spite of what's true. Mm -hmm. mm. The power of That's the idea right. of justice, it really shows how important this text is. Yes, yes, it really is important. And so there's a good segue to go into section 16, because here we're going to go on to tie together more of um, how justice fits in with the other um, with the other virtues as well um, so going on then with um, Socrates through these waters then we have with difficulty made our way and we are fairly agreed that the same kinds equal in number are to be found in the state and in the soul of each one of us that is so. Then does not the necessity of our former postulate immediately follow, that as and whereby the state was wise, so and thereby is the individual wise? Surely. And so whereby and as the individual is brave, Thereby, and so is the state brave, and that both should have all the other con constituents of virtue in the same way? Necessarily. Just two, then, Glaucon, I presume we shall say a man is in the same way in which a city was just. That, too, is quite inevitable. But we surely cannot have forgotten this, that the state was just by reason of each of the three classes found in it, fulfilling its own function. I don't think we have forgotten. We must remember, then, that each of us also in whom the several parts within him perform each their own task, he will be a just man, and one who minds his own affair. We must indeed remember. Does it not belong to the rational part to a rule? being wise and exercising forethought in behalf of the entire soul, and to the principle of high spirit to be subject to this and its ally? Assuredly. Then is it not, as we said, the blending of music and gymnastics that will render them concordant intensifying and fostering the one with fair words and teachings and relaxing and soothing and making gentle the other by harmony and rhythm. 
Quite so. And these two, thus reared and having learned and been educated to do their own work in the true sense of the phrase, will preside over excuse me, will preside over the appetitive part, which is the mass of the soul in each of us, and the most insatiate by nature of wealth, they will keep watch upon it, lest by being filled and infected with the so-called pleasures associated with the body, and so waxing big and strong, it may not keep to its own work, but may undertake to enslave and rule over the classes which it is not fitting that it should, and so overturn the entire life of all. By all means. Would not these two, then, best keep guard against enemies from without, also in behalf of the entire soul and body, the one taking counsel, the other giving battle, attending upon the ruler, and by its courage executing the ruler's designs? That is so. Brave too, then, I take it, we call each individual by virtue of its, of this part in him, when, namely, his high spirit pers uh, preserves in the midst of, uh, midst of pains and pleasures the rule handed down by the reason as to what, it, what is or is not to be feared. Right. But wise by that small part that ruled in him and handed down these commands, by its possession in turn within it of the knowledge of what is beneficial for each and for the whole, the community composed of the three. By all means. And again, was he not sober by reason of the friendship and concord of these same parts, when, namely, the ruling principle and its two subjects are at one in the belief that the reason ought to rule, and do not raise faction against it? The virtue of soberness, clearly, temperance is nothing else than this, whether in a city or an individual. But surely now a man is just by that which and in the way we have so often described. That is altogether necessary. Well then, has our idea of justice in any way lost the edge of its contour so as to look like anything else than precisely what it showed itself to be in the state? I think not. We might completely confirm your reply and our own conviction thus. If anything in our minds still disputes our definition, by applying commonplace and vulgar tests to it. What are these? For example, if an answer were demanded to the question concerning that city and the man, whose birth and breeding was in harmony with it, whether we believe that such a man, entrusted with a deposit of gold or silver, would withhold it and embezzle it, who do you suppose would think that he would be more likely so to act than men of a different kind? No one would. 
and would not he be far removed from sacrilege and theft and betrayal of comrades in private life or of the state in public? He would. And moreover, he would not be in any way faithless either in the keeping of his oaths or in other agreements. How could he? Adultery, surely, and neglect of parents and of the due service of the gods would pertain to anyone rather than to such a man. To anyone indeed. And is not the cause of this to be found in the fact that each of the principles within him does its own work? in the matter of ruling and being ruled. Yes, that and nothing else. Do you still then look for justice to be anything else than this potency which provides men and cities of this sort? No, by heavens, I do not. Okay, thank you both. And going back here, we have a definition. If you look on page 407, so it's 441E. And this the fun is number 441E. Um, we have here another, again, a definition of justice, but this time adjusted a little bit to fit what we've been saying about the soul. Um, that the several parts within us perform each their own task. So now he took the definition from the city-state of each person doing their own task, the carpenter and so on. And now he's saying that it's each of the several parts within us, the three parts of the soul, each performs its own proper task. This will be the just man and the one who minds his own affair. After this, the discussions that we've had of the three parts of the soul, does this make sense now? What would it look like for a person who is acting just according to this definition, that each part of the soul is carrying out its own proper function? What does that mean? That he would have all three of the virtues. Uh... So, wisdom, temperance, and courage uh, doing okay. their mm -hmm. part. Mm. Okay, so how are the three parts of the soul function? We have the rational part, the high-spirited part, and the appetitive part. If, they are, if the virtues are all functioning, as you're saying, and this, these three parts then would all be in their own proper role? Right. What does that mean? Can... He seemed to mm -hmm. make. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure if it this, mm -hmm. but seemed to relate the virtue to mm -hmm. the tripartite soul, mm -hmm. assigning each part of the soul to that virtue. Okay. Um. So. Which part of the soul, then, would you assign wisdom to? The rational. The rational part. And how about um, courage? Thumos. Hmm. What would you assign, then, um, Sofrasun to, or temperance? The appetitive. Yeah, if you were going to assign it to one part, then I think it would be closest to that, that the appetitive part is... Accepting the rulership, right, of, right. of the wisdom-loving part. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so just as the three parts functioning together. Mm. Anything you wanted to add to that, Jed? Yeah. yeah um, so we have a, a ruling part. We have a mm. angry or energetic thumos guard dog part and we have a desiring part mm -hmm. um that's how they're ordered 
Mm-hmm. Um, but have we have we got what they're doing? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to jump in a little bit to um, the next page, page 409. We have a little bit about brave, wise, and sober mentioned on this page here. Um, Brave, I take it, we call each individual, this is in the middle of the page, um, let me give you the Stephanus number, 442, just above 442C. Brave we call each individual by virtue of this part in him, when namely his high spirit preserves in the midst of pains and pleasures the rule handed down by the reason as to what is or is not to be feared. So we see that the brave part is following the rulership of the wisdom-loving parts, the reason. And remember when we first talked about courage, we talked about the laws. So reason is ruled by the laws. Do you remember the two laws? Pop quiz. Do either of you remember the two laws? I know. I know Jed knows it. I'll, I'll say like uh, it's the gods, they don't change and they are always good. Only good. good. Yes. Yes. Exactly right. And simple. And so, I'm sorry? And simple. And simple. Yeah, there there are two laws, but there seem to be three mm-hmm. elements within it. They they mm-hmm. don't change. They tell the truth. They're good, mm-hmm. and they mm-hmm. are simple. And that seems to be a third part mixed in mm-hmm. with um, one of them. Simple in what sense? One. Third one. Yes. And so the reason part is following the laws. And so the brave part or the high-spirited part then follows the, the rulership of, um, of the wisdom-loving part and does not um, get distracted by pains or by pleasures and knows what is or is not to be feared because it knows going against the laws is what is to be feared and nothing else is. The wise part is that small part, the small, remember in the discussion of wisdom, he said it's the smallest part of the soul. So that's brought in again. It's the small part that ruled in him and handed down these commands by its possession and turn within it of the knowledge of what is beneficial for each and for the whole and the community composed of the three. Right. So so the wisdom loving, mm, oh, sorry. uh, Go on. No, please. Um, so these are what they're doing in relation to each other. The high-spirited mm-hmm. follow the commands of the reason, mm-hmm. the desires. Mm-hmm. Mm, read mm-hmm. Plato and don't eat all the cookies. Mm-hmm. But once they are ordered in that way, have we really got what justice is? What are they doing as a whole? Like, what are those orders? What are those mm-hmm. instructions? Well, the, the the easy answer is that they're following the laws, and they're living in accordance with divine law. Which is what? But on a, that God is good, that God doesn't change form, God is simple. Right. These seem to be mm-hmm. um, um, maintenance things. Mm-hmm. Like, in your life you're, you have goals that you try and reach. During those goals, mm-hmm. you're going to face ups and downs, pleasures and pains, desires mm-hmm. and fears, but mm-hmm. keep in mind, God is good, God is simple, God um, is true. Mm-hmm. That will help you keep going. Also, you're going to desire certain things. Keep in mind that, you know, don't look at the car crashes, even though you might want to. Mm-hmm. Um, so, this kind of is like a um, in the meantime, or a maintaining uh ordering of the parts of the soul but to what end like what specifically would they be doing together one once ordered in this sort of a way they would be living justly they would be functioning justly which is doing what i'm not sure what what like what's the point is that what you're asking like what are they he doesn't say what the point is 
What's the meaning? Their function. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what's the point? What's the meaning of it all? He doesn't say at this point. He's just saying this is how to function justly. Right. It's it seems to be not what justice mm -hmm. is. It seems to be how to it seems to be more the preconditions oh, it, for justice. It's how he, justice function. Mm. Well, how the parts within the whole function in relation to each mm -hmm. other. So you could say, like, mm -hmm. uh, for a human body, make sure that mm -hmm. your hand does what your elbow is pointing direction mm -hmm. to, and your elbow mm -hmm. is following your shoulder, and and mm -hmm. that's all following your brain, and and mm -hmm. and make sure your elbow is only doing elbow things, and mm -hmm. and don't do toe things with your fingers. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do that, then you'll be functioning justly. Then someone could come along mm -hmm. and say, well, hang on a second, that seems to be justice for the parts or mm. preconditions for justice as the whole. But once you're ordered, can you say that a man whose mm. fingers do finger things, his fingers fing and his toes do toe things, is that a just man? Or is there another thing that we're missing? Well, it's a just toe and a just finger, <laughs> as you described. But the just person is the one whose soul is functioning in this way. But the definition of justice, I think you know, is in the next section. Oh, I'm, 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 I don't know that. I'm just following along. I'm I, like, I can see how it's reason. I just think, well, yeah. What yeah. do you do? Like, what well, do I do? What to he's make... doing in this section. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see what he's doing in this section. So he's describing these three: brave, wise, and sober. And he's giving it, and we're getting a better sense of what it is because to just say what it is to be just, to just give a definition, it doesn't really do it for us. We have to. It has to sink in and we have to feel it at a deeper level. And that's what he's giving us here. He's giving us many different images and different ways of coming at it. And we're getting more texture as we go through this. So I think already we can see that we have a better sense of what courage is and what wisdom is and what temperance is by seeing the way they function together. Now that we've he's brought in the idea of the three parts of the soul. So it's starting to... Um, as opposed to just like a bare bones definition, we're starting to get some texture and putting some meat on the bones here. And so that's what he's building. But you're right that there's still more to see. Um, I want to go back to page 407 for a moment because there he brought in the idea of music and gymnastics. So he's making references to many things in the past, right? We had went back to the dogs and we went back to seeing the, the other virtues and now how do they fit in here? And then he brought in again the blending of music and gymnastics. And so now we have to understand the blending of music and gymnastics in light of what we now understand about the high-spirited part. So I want to jump back a little. Um, let me see. Two seconds. I'm looking now at um, page 261 in this book. It's um, 402C. And uh, for those of you using the PDF, it's PDF page 277 or screen 277. So if you just type in 277, it'll jump you to this page. And you can see here the definition of a true musician. And it reads, we shall never be true musicians. Neither we nor the guardians that we have undertaken to educate until we are able to recognize the forms of soberness, courage, liberality, and high-mindedness in all their kindred and their opposites too, in all the combinations that contain and convey them, and to apprehend them in their images wherever found, disregarding them neither in trifles nor in great things, but believing the knowledge of them to belong to the same art and discipline. And so there is a reminder of what music is. The person who has mastered music, the true musician, if you will, is he calling it here, is the person who understands states of mind and who recognizes them in others. And then we combine that with gymnastics. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit more to screen 303, which is page 287 in this book. It's 409B, Stephanus number. 
I'm going to just, I'm going to go to a few pages, scroll to a few pages here. But first we're seeing here that the toils of gymnastics, I'm at the bottom of the page, he will undertake with a view to the spirited part of his nature. So now we have an idea of what that spirited part is. And he wants to arouse this rather than for mere strength. We're not doing what he's calling gymnastics is not our common notion of gymnastics. It's not for strength. It's with a view to that spirited part. And high spirited is mentioned throughout. I'm going to jump now to section 18. It's just a few pages down. This is uh, page 291, 411AB, A, B, that area. Where he's, this is where he was talking about um, the different kinds of music, like the dirge-like airs, which we're now speaking. Um, the first result is that the principle of high spirit, if he had it, it would be softened like iron and made useful instead of useless and brittle. So when you combine music with gymnastics, bringing in the study of states of mind, it will soften the high-spirited part, make it useful instead of useless. But if you stay with it too long and you worry about states of mind too much, you may start second-guessing yourself and you become too soft. And that's what he goes on to say. And this whole section culminates here at the bottom of page 293. Um, for those of you with a different text, it's uh, 412a. So he gives them many examples of the mistakes that can come when we're, we incorrectly combine music and gymnastics. Too much music or too much gymnastics. And then he says, It seems there are two arts which I would say that some God gave to mankind, music and gymnastics, for the service of the high-spirited principle and the love of knowledge in them. Not for the soul and the body, except incidentally, but for the harmonious adjustment of these two principles by the proper degree of tens tension and relaxation of each. And remember, we talked about blending the two to have the most perfect and harmonious musician. So remember before we talked about how the, he calls this a musician, not a gymnast. And now that we have seen the relationship of the wisdom-loving part with the high-spirited part, we see that the high-spirited part is the helper of the wisdom-loving part. And so this person is not a gymnast, but a musician. Okay, but the high-spirited part is the helper. And we see how that, and maybe we get a better sense of how the high-spirited principle works together with the musician sure okay so jacob what are you seeing here now that you're putting the two coming back seeing music and gymnastics in this new light well ju just that gymnastics had directly to do with thumos and that through mm -hmm. uh the thumos then we uh, are able to assist in the uh, rational part, which helps us comprehend the states of mind that make us uh, mm -hmm. a good musician. Mm -hmm. mm. Good. Yeah. Anything you want to add, Jed? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Uh, same. I'm on the same puzzle. Um, uh, yeah, I like that description Jacob gave. Re recognize states of mind. Um, each part doing its thing. It's kind of like we're going to depth describing how the hand fits with the shoulder, how the legs do leg things, like how to run fast and stuff. But um, we haven't, from, at least I haven't seen it. Um, we haven't yet seen where are the legs running to. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I can see how they're serving each other and there's a hierarchy within it, but what they're doing with all of that business, mm. I, I haven't seen mm. yet. But I, but I right, wonder. Yeah. Okay. So I was just going to add to what you were saying here that we can imagine a person who is a business person 
being a just business person. And we can also imagine a Socrates, who is a very spiritual man, being a just spiritual man. And we're not really seeing the distinction of which is the best or the most just life, if you will. Yes, exactly. And and those problems that we saw with the examples of um, somebody who um, is living a bad life, like let's mm-hmm. say the businessman who thinks mm-hmm. that True justice is earning the most personal profit for himself because that's what makes you good. That's what puts food on the table for your family and so on. Um, That if they could be functioning in this way we just described, but will fight to the death to defend capitalism or or equally so for like a religious fundamentalist. We do have to distinguish between um, images of justice and actual justice. So a person who is fighting for the death for saving all their money is probably not going to fit his definition of justice. In fact, you know, when he gets to the books eight and nine, when he gives the other constitutions, this is the aristocracy, but when he gives the other constitutions, like the oligarchy, he's going to show that it's, it's actually not a just soul, that it doesn't have the correct balance of the three. Well, I don't know. So, I mean, um, a good businessman will... He's not going to be good at business if he doesn't reason about the markets, and he's not going to be a good businessman if he doesn't judge the states of mind of the other people where he's making deals with. He's not going to be a good businessman unless he has a high-spirited part that will fight for his best in his contracts, and he's not going to be a good businessman if his desires just run rampant and he spends all his money on luxury goods. So a good businessman like this seems to be what's meeting the definition of justice so far. But is he living the definition of wisdom? Is he In following that, the law? Abso- well, absolutely. Um, he's, re- he's having the other parts of his soul ruled by his reasoning. Otherwise, he wouldn't be a good businessman. And he can probably say, well... Is, I think that you're making a... You've, you've moved from um, being logical from what he calls wisdom to what colloquially we call wisdom is being logical. Just because you're thinking with your head doesn't mean you're living wisely. Well, I guess that's where it comes down to, right? Like, even as a businessman, there are a lot of religious businessmen who think Mm -hmm. that God is good and God doesn't deceive, and therefore Mm -hmm. he deserves his wealth. Why would God put him in a rich family if God Mm -hmm. was not good? So he is Mm. reasoning, um, ruling Mm. his spirited part and his appetite of part. Mm. He does have a belief that reality, he deserves his wealth because reality or God is good. So, so far, even this businessman Mm. is meeting, Mm. unless, of course, is meeting the definition of justice, which is why I'm puzzled. Like, I think think we're missing something. I think we're still talking about Mm -hmm. parts. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, you can certainly be a business person who is spiritual, you probably won't be a rich business person, (laughs) but um, you can live somewhat, you can have a somewhat just soul. Like in in the apology, remember Socrates talked about how he would go around questioning people, and he found that the artisans and the craftsmen, they did better with this questioning than, say, the sophists and the politicians did. And so there was a certain degree of um, justice within their souls. But even they fell short of being able to answer all the questions. But there is a certain, you can, there is a certain degree, you might say, of justice that you can um, imagine within um, a person who is a business person, a moneymaker even. Yeah, I mean, just look that, at all those evangelists. Yeah. They have lots of money, and they're very clever. Uh, no, that's going in a different direction than what I'm talking about. They're not what I would call just people. Right. I'm talking about, like, you're, you're, you know, we can think of even people in our own communities who are, you know, good, decent people, and they work a regular day job. They don't do philosophy necessarily, but they have a, a certain intuition. They're basically good and moral people, and they may have some degree of this kind of justice in the soul, that they do have their beliefs about God. They need to question them, and we don't agree with everything that um, I think we have established here that what we're doing is different than what 
um, the Bible is doing in, in some regards, even though there is some areas of agreement. But um, they have their religious beliefs and they um, have a certain, you know, their high spirited part um, is following what is basically good and their desires more or less may fall in line there. Maybe they, their desires are not running rampant, you know, and um, so there is some degree of justice within the soul. Um, we can imagine such a person. We all know such people. Um, and, but we do see, as you're saying, that there is a difference between that and the example of Socrates as like the epitome of the virtuous person. Well, and so we haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. Well, so far, mm. I can think mm. of like those rich evangelist preachers mm -hmm. meeting all these criteria very well, especially the music and especially mm -hmm. the high spirited, um, how animated they get up on stage and, and how they can judge the states of mind of the audience. And, and, um, and they can, you know, be on stage for three hours, keeping their desires for like a snack in check and, and um, to make money. Many and they also believe people. that God, Many corrupt people are very good at reading you. That's not the same as being a musician, though. Well, in the fact that they're able to judge states of mind of others and, and act yeah, according. Yeah, in a very simplistic way, we can say that the con artist is a master at reading states of mind. It does not mean that they are wise. Well, okay, so, so, so what I'm saying is mm -hmm. so far all of the, the parts that we've gotten Mm -hmm. um, for justice so far, very well mm -hmm. seems to meet this example of this kind of person. But then you introduce the idea of, um, well, there are some people like that, not, maybe not the guy on stage, but regular folk who mm -hmm. we can say, uh, you know, have these qualities and they're generally mm -hmm. good moral people. But then mm -hmm. when even that idea of looking upon these people and saying, oh, they're good and moral, within their group, they have that, like, part of their thing is within their group, they look upon each other and they will say, oh, based on what we feel is good and moral, we meet the criteria. So there mm -hmm. seems to be something objective. Oh, that's that's the whole. That's one of the big appeals to religious groups is that sense of community and family. And you can look at your neighbor and say, "Well, he might have flaws, but generally he's a good and moral per person." Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Because he does what we all do, and that's what we feel is mm -hmm. the right thing. So mm -hmm. it seems to me that if that's the case, and these people meet this these criteria, then there seems to be something else on top of this that we need to establish to distinguish a regular religious folk person or, you know, the, the head dude with all the money who so far meets the criteria. And the thing that I think we're bringing in that might make that distinction is when you brought in the idea of Socrates. Even though it's not written so far, we do have a dude that might be personifying something that we're missing. And in my own reflection, as we were, were thinking about it, well, what does make the difference? If everything else fits the idea of justice, what makes the difference? And um, while we've got this high-spirited part that defends your idea of Christian good or Muslim good or Judaic good or whatever it is that you happen to believe, even though they're in conflict with each other and even internal mm -hmm. conflict and contradictions, if you have that high-spirited part supporting that idea of the divine and you know you read the torah and you reason very well and you're keeping your desires in check you're dressing modestly all of these things what makes the difference and the only thing mm -hmm. I, I can see so far is even when this is happening always um relinquish to or always put above all of the things this kind of dialectic dialogue mm -hmm. so if your idea of justice is challenged as a muslim 
you could say, well, in, in, in what we've read, to be a guard dog and defend that to the death is a just thing. We could say, right, that is right within the part. But the thing that makes the difference is Socrates is above everything as um, interested in dialogue and reasoning to, to reason about one's idea of justice. Not to be fervently attached to whatever we already think, or um, I mean, of course, at the beginning there was that injustice when Socrates was being kidnapped, and he did have an idea of justice that he wasn't questioning, and he was going to fight for that idea of justice. But as soon as somebody said, "Let's talk about what justice is," he's like, "Yep." Let's let's go for that. Even though these guys were going to kidnap me, and they said we're not going to listen, and we're going to kidnap you, and you got to outnumber us and fight us if you want to get out of this. Even though everything that I have learned about justice says that that's unjust, and even though what we've described within the soul, in the parts of the soul, is my high spirited part should fight to the death for my idea of justice. Even though all that's happening, as soon as the opportunity to reason in dialogue about what is true, about what is just, comes up, always take that option. That seems to be, at least so far for me in the text, the only thing that can distinguish mm -hmm. a Socrates character from a very good, well-ordered, internally just banker, evangelist, and so on. Mm. Yeah, here. and I think that you make a good point here that he's talking about justice here and wisdom is something else, right? And um, each of these um, virtues, as we've been talking about many times, is that they're, they're not an all or nothing thing. And you can grow in wisdom. And as your understanding of the laws and your understanding of metaphysics, for example, deepens, you're going to move from that basically a uh, moral banker, for example, to someone more like Socrates. You're going to move more towards that. And, your idea, and then that means that your soul will become increasingly wise. It becomes, and if you have the courage to follow that path, and it takes courage because there are unknowns that are fearful and there are social, um, so, um, You'll have to, you'll hit against social barriers that can be fearful. And, um, and there may be pleasures along the way also, as you get benefits, as more people are drawn to you, that could be um, a distraction as well. But if you have that courage, you're going to grow in courage as you go deeper into your studies. And then also as your desires, we talked to, when we talked about temperance, we talked about how the desires will come more in line where it's rather than pulling them along. Like in these examples, it's always, there's a conflict between reason and the desires. But as we grow in soft for soon, there's less of a battle and the desires eventually fall in line with wisdom. And so justice also is increasing. Yeah. So it is a continuum. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think you hit the nail on the head on why that principle that I put forward is true, because um, if we introduce the idea of growth, that's the idea we have to introduce, that we are here to learn, which means growth. The only way you can grow in your idea of justice is reasoned dialectic uh, conversation mm -hmm. on your ideas, your beliefs, um, your understanding, and specifically your idea of justice. That's the only thing that will allow for growth. So while at the start, um, Socrates might have been high-spiritedly defending his idea of justice, as soon as that opportunity for dialogue, that trumps everything, always. If someone says, I want to talk, I want to understand, always go for that one, because that's the only way in which you can learn. So therefore, if we recognize that humans are not perfect, we're not born perfect, equally so just because you happen to be born into a Catholic family, you're, you don't just stay there. You don't just defend your beliefs, loyalty, and you don't start right with everything and you defend that until you die. You have to have learning, which means conversation, which means reasoning, 
to all the things they did at Catholic school of like, you know, don't ask questions, just have faith, all that kind of crap is the exact antithesis for justice mm -hmm. because of the principle of learning. And equally so for punishments, the idea of if someone made a mistake, you can punish them and that's just doesn't make sense because of this principle of learning. And so many people I know defend what they learned when they were four years old because, you know, if that turns out to be mistaken, instead of seeing that as an opportunity for learning, that's an opportunity to be punished or put to death or put in jail or something. So the idea of punishment um, uh, speaks against this fundamental concept of human learning. And I think this has been a theme for us all the way through. Like Jacob and I have been talking about um, courage and how we need to like um, uh, hold on to these, the teachings that we get through right opinion from the person with understanding, unless we don't have it yet. But then you step in and say, well, actually, in the ideal, you won't have to do that. Like temperance, in the ideal, you won't have to discipline your desires. Everything will fall in line. But then we've been saying, well, that makes sense. But in the meantime, while we get there, don't we have to sort of relinquish our right opinion to someone who does have understanding or, and when we do feel fear or we do our, we are in pain, don't we have to kind of like push ourselves and like a gut, like fights or use our whatever thumos we have to hold on to these right opinions. Whereas someone like Socrates, the way he's portrayed on the battlefield doesn't have to. The difference between the learning and the ideal. And if we recognize that's the human journey, the learning process, then we say the thing that distinguishes all that we've learned so far about justice from real justice is simply be, in order to learn, always relinquish to reasoned reflection and understanding. Mm, yeah, very nice. Yeah. And Jacob, anything you want to add? Just that uh, I had made a note about wisdom being a state of mind in which you per uh, persevere towards to true justice. Mm -hmm. So wisdom giving mm -hmm. you that uh, perpetual learning and wanting mm -hmm. to know more about it. Mm -hmm. uh, that was all. Yeah. yeah, very nice. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're going to stop it there today. Um, we should be able to wrap up book four next week. I think we will. And so we'll see more about justice. So this will wrap up his definition of justice and also looking at injustice. And so that will be next week. Um, those of you watching on YouTube, as always, if you have any questions or comments, you can leave those below or drop me an email. And as always, please like, please subscribe, share with a friend, and hopefully uh, we'll be here next week. We'll certainly be here. I hope you'll join us. So long. Bye-bye.